and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am happy, as always, to be with you for another great author interview. As we get started, I do want to remind you, as always, to please like, follow, and subscribe to the show on whatever platform you are either listening to or watching this program on, this episode on. If you want to support the uh, show and the network as a whole in another way, you can do that by going to gsmcpodcast.info. You see that link playing in the video next to me. Uh, There you can leave a tip or a donation. If you'd also like to leave a question or a comment along with that tip, you can do that. I would be happy to engage with questions or comments uh, at the beginning of the next episode after receiving any of those. So again, that is gsmcpodcast.info. As always, I thank you for all of the support that you give, not only this uh, this podcast, but the network as a whole, it's all greatly appreciated. So how is your week going? How is, how was your weekend? Um, for some reason, the weekend feels like it was a really, really long time ago. I'm not a hundred percent sure why that is. It was only two days ago. I think it was because I was not feeling well over the weekend. I had maybe a touch of food poisoning, maybe a touch of stomach bug of some sort, Anyway, Saturday was just not a great day. My tummy was not happy with me, and so I spent a lot of time sleeping. Um, Did manage to do an interview on Saturday, though. That's the interview that I'm uh, presenting in this episode today, so I was grateful to be feeling better in time for that interview. Hope that your weekend um, was better than that. Hopefully the heat is not quite so intense where you are now. I know it's still been crazy in the U.S., it has not been terrible here. I cannot complain. Um, it's been nice. It's been warm, but not like what I'm hearing about at home. And uh, even talking to my mom in Montana, it's way too hot for this early in the summer in Montana. It's not looking good for fire season, but um, at any rate, we are probably not here for a weather report. Uh, although you know me, I talk about weather all the time. <laughs> Go being middle-aged. I love it. I'm, I'm embracing my my talking about my weather era. But let's instead talk about books. Uh, one book in particular. I am speaking with Parisa Akbar today. Akbari, excuse me, today. We are talking about her book. It is called Just Another Epic Love Poem. There you see Parisa and um, the book cover. And now let me go ahead and give you the description of that book. It is Young Adult. Um, Best friendship blossoms into something more in this gorgeously written queer literary romance is how this description starts. Over the past five years, Mitra Esfahani has known two constants, her best friend B. Ortega and the book. A dog-eared mole skin, she and B have been filling with the stanzas of an epic, never-ending poem since they were 13. For introverted Mitra, the book is one of the few places she can open herself completely and where she gets to see all sides of brilliant and ebullient B. There they can share everything. Mitra's complicated feelings about her absent mother, Bee's heartache over her most recent breakup, nothing too messy or complicated for the book. Nothing except the one thing with the power to change their entire friendship, the fact that Mitra is helplessly in love with Bee. Told in lyrical, confessional prose and snippets of poetry, just another epic love poem takes readers on a journey that is equal parts joyful, heartbreaking, and funny, and as Mitra and B navigate the changing nature of I Love You. And again, that is the description of just another epic love poem. Again, it's YA. It is about the two uh, characters that you see on the cover there, although told from the point of view of Mitra. She is the protagonist. She is the one without the glasses in the cover on the cover, if you are wondering. This is so beautifully done in so many ways. I, I really enjoyed this book, not because it not only because it got me out of the five week or five book thriller streak, (laughs) although I appreciated it for that as well, but um, just the way the characters are so well developed, the, the, the complexities of 
oof, being a senior in high school, trying to figure out your life, going to college, not going to college, what you're going to study in college, who are you going, you know, a relationship. Mitra and B are navigating going from friends to being girlfriends to being in love. Um, they've been, they've loved each other for years. They met when they were 13 and now they are talking about being in love and they have plans to go to university together. But is that the best thing for both of them? What is that going to look like? I, I don't want to go back to that time in my life for anything. Although, I mean, parts of it, sure. When they were, when they were doing college campus tours, I was like, you know, there are things that I would go back to school for. Um, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to go back to those, those, those adolescent middle eight, middle school, high school years for, for anything. It just, you're navigating so much. And um, in the interview, Parisa does such a beautiful job of talking about what it's like to be this age and to be trying to deal with a lot of adult issues and a lot of adult, um, well, issues, emotions, situations, but not being considered an adult. And this book really does explore a lot of that. There are some really great secondary characters. There's some great intersectionality with the fact that um, Mitra is, uh, her family is Muslim. She's going to a Catholic school. She is queer. She's bisexual. She is, um, she's her parents uh, are divorced her mother has a substance abuse problem like there's there's so many layers and she's trying to navigate all of these things and just whew. <laughs> um, but just it's so so well written it's such a good exploration of these issues that these two characters are trying to work through and some some really hard things that they're trying to work through so i'm going to stop blathering. I feel like I've gone into blather mode. And we're going to let Parisa talk about the book and the, um, the everything that went into write, the writing of the book. So again, it is called Just Another Epic Love Poem. The author is Parisa Akbari. And let's turn now to that interview. Hello, Parisa. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for being here. I'm excited to talk about your book. It's called Just Another Epic Love Poem. Um, before we do that, though, if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about you so my, my listeners can get to know you a bit, that would be great. Absolutely. My name is Parisa Akbari. I use she and her pronouns. I live in Seattle, Washington, where by day I'm a mental health therapist working mostly with adolescents and queer and trans folks and folks of color and folks with disabilities. And for fun, I love exploring the Northwest. I've got two fluffy dogs and, of course, writing. You, you have fluffy dogs. Um, what, what kind of dogs are they? <laughs> One is a cross between a Malamute and a Husky, we think. So a uh, real extreme fluff there. And then the other one is like a golden retriever lab mix. And she is definitely the sassy and sweet one. And he is the dopey and really just energetic and anxious baby. Yeah. Sounds like uh, some husky traits there. Yeah. Do you just spend <laughs> most of your life sweeping up inordinate amounts of dog hair? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. it. Or just giving in. You just need to start um, collecting it and then you, you can, you can spin it and, and I don't know, start knitting or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, in all your free time. <laughs> um, so as I said, the book is called Just Another Epic Love Poem. Can you give an overview of the story? Yeah. So Just Another Epic Love Poem is a story of two main characters, Mitra and B, who are entering their senior year at a conservative Catholic school outside of Seattle. And Mitra and B have been writing a poem back and forth for the past five years that they call the never ending poem. And it tracks how they've fallen into this deep and intimate friendship. And Mitra is now as a senior recognizing that she has more than friendship feelings for B, that she's fallen in love with B. And so the novel follows how the poem changes and how the girls' lives change as they fall in love with each other and as they face some of the other challenges in their lives, like looking ahead to their future and dealing with some difficult family dynamics that they have going on. 
And so it's told in a combination of poetry and prose, and then other ephemera like text messages, emails, transcripts, and other exchanges. Yeah. What was your initial inspiration or jumping off point for the story? When I was in high school, I tried to think about the way that me and my friends communicated. And it was a little bit different than today. So we were less text heavy on our phones, but we did text. And then we wrote a lot of notes back and forth. So we would be writing each other paper notes in class, passing them between classes or stuffing them in our lockers. We would write these long letters to each other, talking about our feelings and our relationships. And a lot of times we would bring in songs and poetry and other things to try to convey the intensity of our emotions. And then those long phone calls at night. (laughs) And when I thought about it, I realized there was never really an end to the conversation. It was always just one continuous thread that we put commas and we put pauses on, but we would pick back up. And that was a sign of a really deep friendship. And so I wanted to bring that into literature. And the way that I thought about doing that was having a poem that could be that through line that never ends, that they never use terminal punctuation like periods, exclamation points, question marks. They always start on the last word that the previous girl ended her poem on. And so in that way, it's kind of like this um, long conversation with no end that felt like it carried some of the resonances of the ways that I communicated as a teen. Mm -hmm. I am just, I, I, we had no cell phones when I was a teen. So that was, that was pre cell phones, but the, the note writing and the the folding of the note, I, I, a year or so ago, (laughs) I folded a note into the way that I used to fold them in high school and completely baffled uh, (laughs) 20 somethings who were like, what are you doing and why? We had some intricate ways to fold paper. It was yes. like its own little security mechanism of, can you figure out how to unfold this? Yes. No, you don't, you, you don't need to learn origami. You just need to learn no. folding notes. Um, like pre-encryption of everything. We just <laughs> make really complicated paper puzzles for people. Exactly. I love it. Um, let's talk a little bit more about Mitra because she is, um, as the protagonist, she does, she does not when you meet her, she does not fit into her environment. She's not Catholic. She is a a brown girl. She's bisexual. She's, you know, she's got all of these things that seem like they could be working against her and she's trying to figure out her place in the world. Um, What about her is going to resonate with readers, do you think? I think that one of the common experiences of adolescence is a feeling that you don't fit in, you don't measure up, or that there's scrutiny on you. That no matter who you are, what you're going through, you oftentimes have a sense that other people are looking at you, maybe judging you, or um, that you don't shape up in some way. And I think for Mitra, that's really heightened because she is one of the few non-believers, non-Catholic students in a Catholic environment that's very um, strict in its religious beliefs, and they contrast a lot with the upbringing that Mitra had before Catholic school and her education before. And then she's also dealing with having her sexuality unfold and understanding her intimate relationships with other people and how that um, is so Uh, repressed by the Catholic environment that she's in. And so I think whether or not people identify with queerness or with being, you know, um, in this religious environment that you don't fit into, they can probably relate to the feelings that they have to hide a part of themselves to get by to survive. Yeah. I said in my intro that I have absolutely no desire to go back to high school (laughs) and that is accurate but I don't think that habit of um feeling like we need to hide parts of who we are is solely back in high school or college I mean I think that we can relate to that at a lot of different ages and in a lot of different um parts of our lives and uh places that we find ourselves in our lives so for that reason, this book can be relatable to a lot of different people at a lot of different ages and a lot of different stages of life. I think that's something that is incredibly relatable, unfortunately, um, 
that feeling like we need to hide parts of ourselves. So uh, when we are going to take our first break of this episode, when we come back, we'll be talking uh, more on this topic of hiding parts of ourselves and how that affects Mitra's character and her character arc. You are tuned in to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Let's go. I wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. Yeah, I'm tired of shit, and the coffee ain't hit yet. Damn, ain't that great? I don't wanna go to work, cause my boss is a jerk, and I'm not even that paid. I need a change in my life, cause I don't feel alive, and there's nothing that makes me happy. Oh. Hold my beer for a minute I'm about to quit my job Cash in for a ticket I'm going on a trip And I don't plan to visit I'm gonna stay there Till I feel like I'm winning all And this is just the beginning I need a big change Help me feel like living I need a big swing Home runs I'm hitting And I'll never look back Moving on till I get it all And we all got dreams We all want things But what you gonna do for it? How you gonna move for it? What you gonna be? And do you believe Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my conversation with author Parisa Akbari. Uh, as we get going in this second segment, I do want to remind you just quickly one more time that you can go to gsmcpodcast.info, leave a tip or a donation, and that helps support not only this podcast, but also the network as a whole. If you would like to leave a question or comment along with that tip, you can do so. I would love to uh, engage with those questions or comments at the beginning of the next episode following receiving um, said questions or comments. And as always, your support is greatly appreciated. Before the break, Parisa was talking about Mitra's character, and uh, one thing that might be relatable about her character is that feeling of needing to hide parts of who she is because of the situation that she finds herself in, in terms of the school that she goes to and the perception she has of the people around her and how they might perceive her in return. Just wanted to remind you of that as we go into this next topic because we are going to continue with that conversation. So let's get back to the interview with Parisa. And, you know, I don't ever like to talk about too far into the book, but that there is one scene and it won't really spoil anything where she does kind of start looking around and realizing, wait a minute, I don't think other people in this room feel like they fit in either. And I think that's an important moment for her in her in her journey through the book. Yeah, I think that environments that breed shame also breed isolation. And so an environment like Mitra's school, where she's learning that she should conceal her sexuality or be ashamed that she doesn't have the same religious beliefs, or at least that she's just an outsider and a weirdo, um, it breeds a sense of isolation and secrecy and the belief that maybe you're the only person who feels that way and you need to keep that hidden. And I think part of Mitra's journey is understanding that maybe she's not the only person who feels that way. And maybe there can be something beautiful from expressing herself to the people that matter to her to not staying hidden anymore, that she starts to be able to understand that she can relate to even people that she really struggles with. Yeah, I would imagine that your your day job kind of helped to craft parts of the book, not to the point of, you know, giving any, anybody's story away, but kind of gathering those. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you bring you bring that aspect of your life into your writing? Yeah, I think that one of the big lessons I've taken from working with adolescents in therapy is just how much we underestimate them and their capacity and their potential. When I started working as a therapist, I originally was in a nonprofit organization specifically for young girls and trans and non-binary youth. And the first training that we took at that organization was about adultism and about the way that adults really minimize and belittle youth's experience and their knowledge and kind of trivialize their experience by saying like, oh, it's just puppy love or you'll understand when you're older. Um, In my house, my rules, just kind of not treating them as humans who have their own integrity and and deserve respect, even as they may be going through developmental changes that need specific types of support. And I started to see that in my relationships with the teens that I've worked with, 
just how much that age group has to offer. They are not burnt out yet. They are passionate. They are creative. They have a lot of adult problems that they're dealing with, especially today, but they don't have access to adult solutions or adult autonomy. So they're dealing with things like homophobia, racism, impacts of the political sphere that we're living in. And they don't get to make choices about who they vote for or where they live, or even sometimes what they're wearing, what they're eating, how they spend their time. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, there's a lot of stories to be told about that time period. I certainly struggled at that age. And I felt like even just a few adults taking me seriously and treating my emotions seriously made a big difference for me. And so my hope both as a therapist and as a writer, is to show that young people's stories are worth telling and that they have important things to share. Oh, and to do that all within the that time period where your body is changing, your hormones are changing, your brain is developing it. Yeah. I mean, geez, the, no, I don't want to go back, but just to, to it, it adds extra layers. Yeah, and if you think about the songs, the books uh, that maybe impact you today that really get you in your feelings. Oftentimes it's things from that decade of life when we were teens because we were feeling so many firsts. So oftentimes people have their first big heartbreak or big conflict with their family or they have some understanding about their identity for the first time. Everything feels intense and heightened because it's new for them. They don't have a map to compare things to, you know, having a heartbreak in your 50s when you've had dozens of relationships to understand the process of it is going to feel really different than feeling for the first time like you're being torn apart because of grief or loss. And so I think in that way, there's this intensity to young adult literature. And it's something that other ages can relate to because they know what that feels like. They remember yeah. And that's one thing that I appreciate about, appreciated about Mitra's relationship with her poetry teacher, because she, Mitra went into that with expectations of her own that this, this teacher, you know, she was a teacher in a Catholic school. She's a former nun. She's not going to understand X, Y, and Z. And then she realizes, oh, wait, not everybody is how I perceive them. Yeah. yeah. So. I think that Mitra expected her teacher, Miss Acosta, to make a lot of judgments about her. And at the same time, Mitra was making judgments about her teacher and yeah. to see them come together and understand that they can meet each other where they're at and really appreciate what they talk about in the book as being realities, being more important than ideas, that they kind of set aside the ideas that they have about each other and focus on what's your reality. And that helps them connect with each other. Yeah. When you sit down to write, um, do you do you generally start with really good character sketches? Do you have an idea of what these characters are like? Do you prefer to let them evolve as you write? How does that work for you? Typically, an idea for a story will come to me with one image of a scene, and then I'll have questions about that scene. Like, who are these people? What's going on with them? So for just another epic love poem, the image that came to me was Mitra and B sitting in their chapel, sharing their ear pods, listening to music while they're supposed to be paying attention in mass. And that ends up being one of the first chapters in the book. So I had that image in my head and I had to think about who are these girls? Why are they not paying attention? What is it that bonded them together? And what is it that makes them feel outsiders or on the, the margins of this experience? And then I do really enjoy delving into character sketches before I start writing too much of the story because I like to be able to really ground in a sense of voice and character. Um, my stories tend to not be as much about flashy plot and things like that, but more internal, uh, more internal character growth and interpersonal dynamics. So I start with a scene and I start with a sense of character and then I take it from there. Sure. And uh, you could almost call the poetry another character. I mean, it certainly gives us a lot of insight into B and Mitra's relationship. Um, 
So I can only imagine that was a lot of fun, maybe a bit of a challenge to write the poetry, especially in two different voices, to have it be this back and forth conversation. What did that process look like for you? That was fun. And it was kind of like creating a puzzle for myself that I then had to get out of. So it was, I I do like to create problems for myself in writing and then figure out a way out of them. And I think that when you can surprise yourself in writing, then oftentimes you have a better chance of surprising the reader. So I liked to give myself the obstacle of some of the rules that the girls develop for their poem. So for example, um, no terminal punctuation was a tough one. And starting on the first word that the or the last word that the last girl ended on, creating those kinds of resonances gave me some extra challenge in the way that I wrote. And that was um, fun to step into to see how how can I create a thread between all of these different verses of poetry that they write, so that if you were to pull them all out, you could still see that they're a cohesive story together. And Writing the different voices was a fun experience too. I think I looked back to what we were talking about with character development. What are the ways that each of these characters communicate and what do I know about their personalities? And then how would that translate to poetry? So Mitra as a character starts out very reserved, very contained, self-contained, and she's following a lot of rules that she's made for herself as well as the rules of her environment. And so I felt that her poetry would be a little bit more following grammar and syntax, a little bit shorter of lines, and maybe taking less liberty with her form and style. And then B, on the other hand, is pretty outgoing and bubbly. She's messier. She's more verbose and communicative. And so her lines of poetry got to be more expansive, a little bit more free form, um, a little bit more risky in the th- in the ways that she wrote. And that was fun to see how they start and then how those two voices might come closer together as the poem evolves. Yeah. And then how about um, some of the rest of the poetry that they read and study? Was, was that all pretty well known to you or did you seek out poetry that was new to you um, to bring in? I will admit I kind of used the poetry in the novel to showcase some of my favorite poets. (laughs) Um, And I felt like when I was telling Mitra's story, you know, maybe an assumption would be that she would be drawing from the poets that she would learn in school. But I found that the poets I learned in school were oftentimes poets that I couldn't relate to. So, you know, older, oftentimes dead white poets that I felt like I had no connection to, or they didn't understand my lived experience. And the poetry that I did connect to was often poetry by either some of the ancient Persian poets where I felt like there was this cultural or spiritual tie, or some of the more modern poets who talk about things like immigration, family, queerness, Um, outsider identity. And so I drew from poets like Naomi Shihab Nye. She really takes center stage in the book. Um, Aniz Mojgani is somebody that I mentioned, but I read a lot of his work as I was working on this book to help me get into that mindset. He's a Iranian American and black poet who um, really has a conversational or like spoken word tone that I felt would be really relevant or accessible to the the teen readers that especially like Mitra and B would gravitate toward. Um, Mary Oliver, who is a or was a queer poet that that I really felt spoke to me. And Rumi, another ancient Persian poet that has a lot to say about love and about connection. And then the centerpiece for Mitra is Hafez, who is somebody that we go to at times for for holidays. We do divination readings with Hafez. Um, When we have questions about life or existential questions, he's somebody that we turn to. And so being able to integrate that into her understanding of poetry and 
for sort of spiritual connection as a counterpoint to some of the Catholic teachings she's getting. He serves a role um, as almost like another Miss Acosta, another ear, another um, form of guidance for her. And and you use the word integration and something else that I really appreciated um, was Mitra's family traditions and the the, the food. There's a lot of food that <laughs> in the book, um, and you, you weave out you weave that in seamlessly. Like it doesn't feel like it's being shoved into the book for the sake of bringing in this culture. But um, I appreciate that because it it is a culture that I'm maybe not as familiar with, or the food I'm not as familiar with. And so it was really fun to learn about some holidays that I didn't know as much about or the food um favorite food that you wrote about in the book <laughs> oh man well the classic i would say is tadig which is the crispy fried rice at the bottom of the pot when you make polo in persian cooking and that's something that mitra is offered when she is trying to have a meal with her mother and i thought like what a it's, it's one of those foods that has a lot of symbolism to it, that it's like, if you're going to be a good, quote unquote, good wife or good mother, you have to make good tadi to serve to your family, to serve to your guests. Uh, it's a very loving and very desirable, sought after food. And so for her to have to decide, is she going to eat it? Is she going to accept that gift from her mom? Or that comes up later in the book with sour cherry jam. So just the ways that food on the surface is just these textural details, but underneath there's all this meaning about what does it mean to accept love and care from other people when you're struggling with them. So mm -hmm. I had fun kind of playing with that and exploring that. But yeah, I would say her no ruse dinner was really tempting to me. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true about food on the surface being, you, you know, just textural, but food is, food can represent so many different things, not only in books, but in life. And I, I think I've talked about my maternal grandmother and the way she loved us through food and having talked to other people in um, not only interviews, but just in life in general and how their grandmother or some other relative fed them uh, through food or loved them through food. It's it's very common across cultures. And in this case, the, the, the food is representing something a little bit bigger within Mitra's relationship with her mother. And what did it mean to accept the food? And was she condoning or uh, like rewriting boundaries by accepting that food but it's true food food can be so much more than just food right <laughs> um so we're gonna go ahead and take our second break of this episode when we come back parisa will be talking a bit more about what she hopes that readers are going to take away from this book um in particular the um this book in particular, that's the book we're talking about, right? Um, what readers will take away from this book. You are tuned into the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. For the best and latest podcasts available anywhere, go to the podcast app on your cell phone and type in GSMC to access free content-rich podcasts on health and wellness, book reviews, sports, entertainment, relationships, social media, movies, technology, finance, and even weird news. Subscribe and download the GSMC Podcast Network's family of shows, available everywhere podcasts are found. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my conversation with author Parisa Akbari. Before the break, we were talking about food and the broader implications of food, how sometimes it can represent more than just sustenance or um, an item on a plate or, you know, I mean, there's so many different layers to that. But let's go ahead and return now to the interview with Parisa. Uh, do you have an overall hope for what readers might take away from the book? I think being a therapist, the, you know, secret wish that I have is that people will look at their own places of shame and see that they deserve self-compassion. I think that's the journey that Mitra is on, identifying 
the places that she holds shame around her relationship with B, her relationship with her mom, and this belief that she is somehow not good enough or um, that there's a like a darkness to her that she's afraid to identify with. And over the course of the novel, hopefully understanding that in the same way that the people around her deserve compassion, she deserves that as well. And it's really kind of worth the risk of vulnerability to reach out to be, to reach out to others in her life. Um, that that connection is worth the risk of potentially exposing your vulnerabilities or or even speaking your shame aloud. And I think that's something that so many people struggle with that I see as common themes in the work that I do. Is it worth it to be myself, to speak my truth when I could be rejected or somebody might decide that I actually am a bad person? They might see me and reject me and abandon me. Um, but that's the path to really feeling connected to others. And so I think it's a difficult one, but a worthwhile one. Yeah. She really starts seeing people around her as full people, as opposed to just her teacher or her baby sister, you know, that she, she yeah. tends to see in that certain role or her mother, who she has a very complicated relationship with. She starts to see the whole person. Um, so yeah. That's not always easy, even when you're not 17 and yeah. trying to figure out life. Yeah. Um, what about uh, writing for young adults? What do you think draws you to writing uh, for that age group? I think on the one hand, some of the emotional potency that we talked about, that everything is right at the surface and there's so many new experiences. And then at the same time, that tension of, facing adult issues without the power and the control that adults have. That really um, inspires me to write for young adult audience. And then on the other side of it, I think, you know, so many of us are writing to our younger selves and working through and healing our own experiences of hurt at that age. And so being able to tell stories that I wish I had at that age Oftentimes, the books that I read, I could connect to because that's that's what I had available, but I didn't see Iranian American characters in young adult literature. I didn't see queer characters in young adult literature. And when I finally did in my 20s, it just lit something up in me and made me feel like, oh, maybe these stories that I'm holding matter. Maybe they, these are important. Maybe they're um there are stories that I have that deserve to be heard or deserve to be shared. So my hope is that there are other young people who can read this and connect to it and feel like it lights something up for them, that they see that they have a voice that matters. Yeah, absolutely. Are you working on anything currently? I am. I've started working on a new project. It's in the early stages. So I don't know what I'm allowed to say about it, but I'll say that it's going to be young adult and I'm hoping to explore, you know, some similar themes of identity and coming of age, but in a different way through a different lens. And I really have a lot more to share. So I'm looking forward to, to future books ahead of me. Would you ever return to the world in just another epic love poem? Do you think? Oh, I haven't thought about that. I think it would be fun to explore another character's story or maybe follow the girl's future down the road. But where it is right now, I feel satisfied with the way that their story ended, that it's open-ended mm -hmm. and their future is kind of unknown. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other writings that you would like to highlight or talk about? Yeah, by other authors. Is that okay? Or oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm just thinking about how we are in July right now, and it's Disability Pride Month. And from a young adult lens, I just read uh, Anna Sortino's book, Give Me a Sign, which is about uh, deaf and blind summer camp. 
and the a girl who goes to the camp hoping to understand her deaf identity and come into her own and the connections that she makes. So that was a fabulous book that I'd recommend for young adult readers who are looking to celebrate Disability Pride Month. Um, there's also Ellie Haycock is Totally Normal. And um, just saw that one the other day. The title just came up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's been a, a string of young adult disabled novels coming out recently in the last year or two that I really never saw before. So I'm really excited about that, that publishers are finally seeing there's a market and a readership and that these stories are important to tell. So I would encourage folks to look into those. And then um, outside of Disability Pride Month, one of the books I'm reading right now is uh, The Sunbearer Trials by Aidan Thomas. And that is a fan fantastic fantasy folklore tale with uh, Mexican folklore included. And it's a trans and queer sort of epic adventure that I'm really enjoying it by the author of Cemetery Boys. So I'd mm. recommend that for anyone who enjoys fantasy YA folklore type stories. Okay, perfect. Thank you. When it comes to writing, in this case, let's say writing fiction, even though there's a poetry aspect to it, but writing fiction for publication, is it something that you always wanted to do? Or did you decide to do that later in life? What did that look like for you? Yeah, I actually as a kid wanted to be a therapist or a writer. So I don't know what it was, but I <laughs> that I got that idea in my head as a kid. And then I didn't actually believe that I would follow that path. I went to school thinking that I would go more into social psychology or maybe into some of the research. But as I got further down that path, I found that I was gravitating again towards stories and that took me in the direction of therapy, being able to explore um, narratives and the meaning that we make from the experiences in our lives. But then as I was continuing in my journey as a therapist, I really felt like I was making space for other people's stories and I missed the creativity and exploration of my own. And that's what got me back into writing. And especially at the time of the 2016 election, as I was sitting with my clients, you know, day in and day out and seeing what they were struggling with and oftentimes feeling like my generation had let down the younger people in my life that I, I would think about like, what are we as adults leaving for the next generation and for children and um, just feeling disheartened by that, that I felt like maybe writing for young adult literature could be one way that I could offer some sense of optimism or hope, uh, some idea for young people that their futures could have promise, they could be loved and accepted, and that again, their stories mattered. And so I felt like that was my way to both spark some more hope in myself and to hopefully pass that forward for young people who might feel really disillusioned by the world that they're inheriting. Yeah. yeah and actually that, that makes me think of something you were saying earlier. Uh, uh, I had the same thought is that sometimes a lot of times right now, the world can feel like a dumpster fire. Um, that's yeah. a phrase I use a lot dumpster fire. Um, but the glimmers of hope and one place I get glimmers of hope is the representation I see with the authors that I talk about. It's yeah. more people can see themselves from younger ages in the books that they read. It's not just yeah. white cis het relation, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's expanding and that's exciting. I think the world yeah. might still be a dumpster fire, but they're glimmers of hope. And I think that, you know, speaking again to that question you had about why I write for a young adult audience, I think the young adult and kid lit publishing industry is way ahead of the game compared to adult publishing. And that's not to say that kid lit and young adult is perfect or that they're, you know, doing an amazing, fantastic job of representation. But I think that the progress in that domain is oftentimes leaps and bounds ahead compared to what I see in adult literature. And that's what's so exciting to me is to see that representation of intersectional, you know, queer folks of color and um, disabled queer folks and, you know, all these different nuances that they're exploring 
and the rise of, you know, people being able to tell stories from their own background, from their own identities. I think young adult is really where it's at when it comes to that. And that um, really gives me hope. Yeah, absolutely. From your own experience as a writer, if you could uh, choose one or two things that you would say to someone who also thought is thinking about maybe writing, what what would that advice be? Ooh, I think one thing would be if you can read widely, that not only in the genre you hope to write in, but also in all genres, exceptional books of any, you know, genre of any category are going to be amazing teachers you're going to be able to see what is it that it seems so easy about the way that that author wrote what is it that keeps you hooked and you know how do they organize everything how do they structure everything how do they tell the story in a way that that propels you forward and that keeps your interest and i think that can be true of any medium. You can look at movies and uh, podcasts and TV shows and be able to look at the structure as well. But I think reading in your genre and across genres can really help new writers understand what works and maybe what doesn't if they see things that don't work for them, being able to articulate that. And then I would say persistence. That's a tough one. I think especially for folks who come in with some stuff around perfectionism Mm -hmm. that it may feel like if you can't be great at something from the beginning or if you don't get affirmation in the beginning that it's not worth your effort or time but the reality is that writing is really a constant experience of rejection and a constant sort of pushing that boulder up the hill and then watching it roll back down again And in that way, you've got to have grit and a sense of toughness about persisting for the sake of the art or the experience that you have writing, as opposed to persisting with the goal that um, you're going to get some external validation that will make you take yourself seriously. Because I think in writing that reaches an audience, there's always going to be mixed opinions or rejection or, you know, somebody seeking an, a literary agent or an editor or a publishing deal is going to encounter a lot of feelings of failure on the way. And I hope that folks who are aspiring to be writers can see those failures and those rejections as part of the journey and come back to remembering why it is that they want to write and what it is that matters to them as that's the thing that I think really makes it worthwhile. This is not the first time that someone has talked about failure as being part of the journey in writing. And this is not the first time that I've said that uh, the advice for aspiring authors can be applied to so many other parts of life. I mean, failure is a part of so many different aspects of our life, right? I mean, it just it just is. So uh, that's, that's another reason that I like those... Um, those advice questions, because I just feel like they're they're great. They're great answers to people who might be thinking about writing, but often we get great answers to questions that can be applied in other parts of life as well, not just writing. So let's go ahead and take our last break of this episode. When we come back, we'll be talking about writing poetry versus writing prose and why, when, how, what what determines which one gets written. You are tuned into the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, Parisa was giving advice, um, her advice for aspiring authors. Let's go ahead now and return to the conclusion of this conversation. On any given day, when you sit down to write, what are the outside factors that kind of determine to for you prose or poetry? What what, what will you write that day? Mm. Oh, that's a good one. I think that I get into different seasons and I have seasons of prose and seasons of poetry. And depending on that mood or that season, I'll filter information from the world differently. So I might take a walk and see something really beautiful and then be inspired to write a poem. Or in a different time, I might think that this relates to some bigger story that I want to write into a novel or an essay. And it just depends on how I'm filtering the world. But on another another approach, I would say that um, writing for me is really, um, the physical act of it has been difficult because I have a disability that affects my joints and I have a hard time writing by hand and a hard time typing. I had a lot of experiences of not being able to express myself the way I wanted to. And I started to see that poetry was concise and it was something that I could really um, whittle down to like an essence and be able to maybe say what I'm trying to say in a way that is more accessible to me. So from that perspective, when I'm struggling or when I'm having a hard time physically writing, poetry is a really great accessible vehicle for me. And I think that's true for a lot of people, whether they're disabled or not, whether they're like working parents or single parents, or they're people who don't have a lot of free time. It can be that concise sort of voice of the people that uh, is very economical. Yeah. And it doesn't have to rhyme, although it's yeah. funny to make it rhyme sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, for me, when I, when that poetry is always silly, when I write poetry, it's always silly and it rhymes <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> for no reason other than that's just how it comes into my brain uh, yeah. <laughs> in terms of internet presence if people want to learn more about you um, or the book uh, website if you have one and any social media that you're active on my website is parisa writes.com it's p-a-r-i-s-a writes.com and then i can be found on uh tiktok at Parisa writes and then on Instagram at author Parisa and I do post on Instagram pretty regularly and TikTok a little bit less regularly but share insights into kind of a day in the life of writing some of the different festivals or conferences that I go to and sneak peeks behind the scene of things I'm working on as well as sharing upcoming events and really my passion project is a newsletter that I write once a month that you can sign up for on my website. It's called The Scratch Pad. And that's a place where I get to spotlight other marginalized creators. So people who are making film or TV, music and books. And then I usually spotlight some poetry as well. And it's kind of my way to share all of the awesome queer and trans, BIPOC, disabled creators that I'm obsessed with. Um, so I'm about to send out my July issue, which is all about Disability Pride Month. And I kind of rotate through different themes over the course of the month. But I think that's a really fun way to stay connected and also get some great recommendations for other media that you might enjoy. Okay. Thank you. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to make sure that you highlighted during this time? Hmm. I would just say that I think growing up, I assumed poetry and writing weren't really for me. Mm. And I did it for myself because I felt like I had to, to deal with my feelings. But I hope that people can read just another epic love poem and see that they can take a form and make it their own. I think that's something that queer people have been doing for a long time and you know, taking a space and trying to make it into their own, taking a word or a category that they've been given and stretching it to fit their experience. And I think poetry is the same way that we may have this idea that it's 
you know, for rich old white people who ha- are sitting in their cottages by the fire and they're <laughs> using these complicated rhyme schemes or, you know, structure. And you don't have to be in that position. You can take poetry and make it into something that fits your experience and you can queer it into um whatever you want. So I hope people who read the book can also see that they get that as a vehicle for their own self-expression. Wonderful. I love that. Thank you. And um, thank you also for taking the time out of your weekend to talk to me. I really, really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for chatting with me. Thank you again to Parisa for joining me um, to talk about just another epic love poem. As I mentioned at the beginning, it is so well written. I really enjoyed the characters. I enjoyed the story. Um, enjoyed the the. I, I even enjoyed. I know this is weird to say the ending. I, I like the way that she she brought things to an end not everything was wrapped up. There were some things that were left open for the characters and I appreciate that. But um, having a niece who is um, right around Mitra and B's age at the start of the book and a niece who is their age at the end of the book, it was um, a good read for me to kind of, you know, think about think about how I would talk to them about things that were happening in the book and uh, you know if they were to ever read it conversations we could have about it but if you have a a young adult reader in your life then you may want to look into uh, this book for them or heck I'm not a young adult reader I am just a plain old adult reader and I really enjoyed it so definitely check this out especially if you are at all um, a fan of poetry because it does combine poetry and prose so beautifully and if you have been uh, with the podcast for a while you know that I do sometimes struggle with poetry it's on my struggle list short stories thrillers poetry (laughs) things that aren't always at the top of my reading list. Um, So I always appreciate anything that's going to give me a little bit more of an an entree into poetry and, and just the, the, so listening to Mitra and B and uh, their Miss Acosta talk about it, talk about why they are reading what they're reading, how it affects them, talking about the book and how they use the book as a communication device, etc. Um, all helpful to me and maybe helpful to you or maybe you have uh, a young reader who is also interested in poetry but not quite sure about it or wanting something that is a little more accessible to them. This might be a a good place to start. So uh, thank you again to Parisa for joining me for this conversation. This is another week where we have two episodes, uh, two interviews. So I hope that you will join me for the next one that will be on Friday. And uh, we are switching gears to historical fiction this time. This is Wages of Empire. It is the first of three novels um, set in the early days. Well, this one's set in the early days of World War One, and it's it's it tells the story of the origins of World War One in a really compelling and helpful way because there are some complicated issues that that started world war one and this explores a lot of that through a lot of different lenses and points of view so join me on friday for that conversation with michael j cooper did i say that at the beginning i'm not sure i I mentioned his name i apologize the author is michael j cooper the book is wages of empire that will be friday's episode i hope that you will join me for that i hope that in the meantime Um, If you're a fan of this podcast, you will do a few things like follow and subscribe. Of course, that is a great way to get the podcast out to more listeners and watchers such as yourselves or just more readers, of course, whether you're watching or viewing. Also, leave a positive review that really does help out not only the podcast, but the network as a whole helps to get our information out to more people. And I appreciate all of the positive reviews you can leave. I mean doesn't have to be positive, but uh, it, it is appreciated. Uh, you can also follow the podcast on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, and TikTok. Love hearing from you. Come find the podcast on social media and let me know what you are reading. Hope that your week is going well. Uh, I hope that you are surviving the heat if you're in a heat wave, but I really hope that this week affords you, of course, plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.
Let's go. I wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. Yeah, I'm tired of shit, and the coffee ain't hit yet. Damn, ain't that great? I don't wanna go.